Lauren, I think you're muted. Uh, Taylor and I uh, discussed that today and we said we would start only with the first slide would be mine and we'd go ahead and let Ron speak without uh, the individual slides up was how we planned it this afternoon. Awesome. Well, then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for hopping on today's webinar to learn more about high school women's wrestling in Nebraska. Uh, my name is Julia Salata and I'm the state sanctioning program manager for Wrestling a Girl where I'm overseeing all the state sanctioning task forces in a number of different states, including, of course, Nebraska. Uh, I also wrestle for the U.S. national team, as well as serve as the assistant coach at King University. So I have a lot of irons in the fire in regards to women's wrestling. I'm very passionate about the sport, and I've been fortunate enough to work with the, uh, the sanctioned Nebraska task force for the past couple months now. And they're just a really phenomenal group who are working very diligently and very hard to grow women's wrestling across the state. So I hope that you guys can learn a lot from this webinar and start to see the value in women's wrestling if you're new to the sport. Um, if you've been around for a while, I hope that you're encouraged to go out and recruit girls uh, to come into the sport and do your part to just be involved and be great ambassadors uh, based on the information you get here tonight. So with that, I'll pass it over to Ron Higdon to go ahead and get this started. Uh, most everybody should know who I am. My name is Ron Higdon. I'm assistant director at the Nebraska School Activities Association. Uh, I'm in charge of wrestling for high school in Nebraska, and I am uh, probably the go-to guy if you want information regarding uh, girls wrestling and how we move forward. In this last May board meeting, our board of directors voted to uh, make girls wrestling uh, an emerging sport through the NSA bylaws, and that is something that is, uh, some people look at it as, as not a win, but I think it's a win. Uh, what that does is uh, basically allows schools with the parameters that they set forth to build their rosters and then look at the interest in the state before they sanction it and have a full-fledged NSA girls championship. Now, that being said, uh, the only real difference with um, that and a full sanction is who's sponsoring the championship because uh, less with the Nebraska Scholastic Wrestling Coaches Association. Again, this year is going to uh, host a girls' state championship in Nebraska. And I believe that's going to be in York. And it is um, for duels. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, so let me just give you a couple of little things with regard to the emerging sports status. Uh, information that you might know and, or you might not know. There's some frequently asked questions that I get all the time with regard to it. So I'll just jump right into it. With the girls being an emerging sport, uh, they're still going to register for wrestling. On our website, if you look at it, it doesn't say boys wrestling. It says wrestling. So they're going to register for wrestling. They're going to be on the wrestling team. Now, each school has the ability to choose whether they allow them or want them to wrestle against boys, be it in practice and or in competition. Um, however, we have several schools and several, um, actually uh, even York College yesterday, offered to host girls only competitions. Now that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a standalone girls tournament. It might be a girls division at an already established boys tournament, which is okay. And that's what we've done over the last couple of years. Uh, I at the NSA office are going to is going to facilitate and have already uh, started a competition list that's available on our website under the wrestling tab and there's a girls wrestling uh, tab on the wrestling page that you can go to that shows the dates uh, of the competitions and where they are going to be located and um, who the contact person is if you want to be interested in, in doing that. Anybody is interested in hosting a tournament that's not already listed, uh, just contact me. It's a live document that I will update and it will always be available to you. And you can choose uh, where you want to take your girls if you're gonna have some girls on your team. Or you can uh, let me know that you're gonna host it and I'll put your contact information on there and put the um, location so the teams know what, what they wanna do. The intent of that is so that we're not having a number of competitions all on the same weekend, spread all, you know, maybe two or three of them all in the same area, and it's spreading out the ability for the girls to compete against other girls. What we would like to see is more schools west of um, York, um, because we have a number of schools that are east of York 
and north and even south that are hosting tournaments. And there's a lot of ability for girls to wrestle other girls in those areas. So what we're looking for is for other schools to be willing to host that girls division, maybe with your already established boys tournament. That being said, the girls have the option this year to wrestle either the boys or the girls whenever they go to those competitions. If you go to a competition that has a girls division, there's nobody in their weight, they want to wrestle the boys, they still have the ability to do that, but they don't have to. Um, so um, if there's one thing that I would say about uh, the differences is co-ops. When we sanction, when the NSA sanctioned girls, sanctions girls wrestling finally, teams and schools like all other sports will be able to co-op with other schools just for the girls. At this point, because the girls are a part of the boys program, that co-oping will also have to avoid, involve the boys team. So a school that wants to co-op, it will change your classification enrollment number for the girls side as well. I mean, actually there's not a girls side yet. So that's the, that's the other difference with the non-sanction with the emerging, as opposed to the emerging sport. However, I think this is a good thing. The, the one thing that I would say to coaches, uh, if you look at what our board of directors is able to do, uh, this emerging sport process is a three-year process. And any time during that three years, they have the ability to say, okay, we're gonna sanction it. We're gonna host, host a championship. So my, my gut feeling is they're gonna want more participation than what we have now. And we're right at about 200 girls across the state. I think that with the interest that we have seen through the administrator webinar, through the athlete webinar that we had earlier and the coaches meetings, that there is some interest out there and there's, there's some nif significant interest. You look at bordering states, we've had tremendous growth over the first year from when you sanction, and I think Joe is gonna go over some of those, from the year that they uh, sanction it, prior to the sanction and then after the sanction, there's significant growth. Well, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have, to have some sort of growth in order for our board of directors to say that they're gonna sanction it. I'm sure there's other questions that will be uh, coming up during the webinar. So I'll be here, I'll stay on to answer any of those and any um, coaches that wanna contact me after the fact, feel free to do so. I'm always available via the phone in the office or you can always email me and I'll get back to you right away. But that's it for me, and if you uh, want, I can answer questions now or we can wait till later. Okay. I think we have a question Ron? from Owens. I had, a, I had a question for Ron. Yeah, I got, I got one real quick here too. Um, Ron, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, I can. Okay. Um, is there, do we have any ability to, uh, if we host the tournament, to do anything with the weight classes or changing weights or anything like that? That's a great question. Uh, what we're going to do, uh, in fact, I contacted them. Our board of directors gave me um, representatives from each one of their respective districts to form a committee. Uh, I sent the email out today, set up the first meeting. We are probably, my guess is this is what we'll do. We'll do what other states have been doing that are similar to us. And they're going to wait for that alpha testing. And then we're going to determine girls' weights that are going to be different than the boys. So there's not going to be 14 of them. And there's, they're not going to be the same as the boys. So um, I would wait uh, till, till we get those. And those will be based on alpha testing. And they'll probably try to accommodate everybody. Uh, we have a couple of girls in our state that are some of the heavyweights. Uh, maximum weight is 235. Well, we already have girls that are heavier than 235 and we don't want to promote weight cutting. So our, I anticipate that our heavyweight weight will be higher than 235. Okay. That being said, uh, we don't know what number that, that the number of weight classes that we're going to have and we don't know what those weight classes are going to be as of yet, but that's going to be the charge of the committee that I contacted today. Okay. Thank you. Ron, you, this is Wayne here in Amherst. You mentioned that we're right around 200 numbers or whatnot, and we're all in the promoting <clears throat> phase of things. If you had a guess or a gut feeling, um, do you have a number that we should be shooting for as a target with all of us to hit that the NSA would say, okay, we're, the girls have achieved this number. This is something legitimately we need to look at because if there's 
10, 20, 25 of us around here, everybody's getting five, seven, eight of us. What, what's that number that maybe we should be shooting for? Well, I don't know that there's a, a specific number. Um, and here, I'll give you an example. When we had uh, unified bowling, the, the number was 40 schools. Well, this is, uh, not a t this, is not necessarily, this is an individual sport, so you can't really compare it to that. So we already have over 40 schools that have girls wrestling on them. That being said, if you have one girl on your team, that constitutes a school having uh, girls wrestling. So the number, I don't think, I think that they were probably looking about double that, 400 uh, was probably something in their mind. That's a total guess. However, when they see, when the committee sees the numbers that Joan's going to show them and what Joan's probably going to show you tonight of what other states have done when they sanction girls wrestling, that number is much, in many cases, is below 400. So I'm not sure that that number will be the, the same. That's a guess of mine, but I think that that would be a significant increase. If we do it a hundred percent increase and had 200 girls involved that, I mean, 400 girls involved, that would be, I mean, that, that shows huge growth. And if you look at the numbers year after year, once it's sanctioned, that number continues to grow. And I don't believe Joan, it has ever decreased. It'll always increase once it's sanctioned. So if you look at the data and if the, if the board and the committee looks at the data, I think that that number is not a set number, but it's going to have to be more than what we have now. I, I know that's probably not a great answer, but I'm an optimist and, I, and I'm hoping, I thought initially that number would have to be around 500, but I think it's going to, it, it'll be, it could be lower than that without, without a doubt. Right. Cause all the data that I've seen from the surrounding states is, after it's been sanctioned and we're kind of in the promoting phase <clears throat> and you can look at Kansas and Missouri and you know once it got sanctioned it tripled right you know so if we're sitting around 200 um, or we're trying to convince everybody else that's sitting around the board table that <clears throat> Saturday morning with our group here going forward in the next 12 months I was just looking for a target number um, that maybe we should be trying to put together in our mind, if this is where we're at, here's a good number for where we can say that we went to and everybody in the group says, all right, everybody got to go promote it and group it. And if it's seven across the board or whatever, you know, then we can kind of calculate maybe where we should be trying to achieve in 12 months from now. I think that's a, I think that's a great perspective and I think that's a great approach. I, here's what I think we should do. I, I will communicate to our committee that has been formed and I will try to get a feel for what their recommendation is going to be the board. We have two board members, uh, actually one board member that's on the committee and she's the one that, that has some influence. So if we can, if I can get a kind of a, an idea from her, from the committee meetings, then I will definitely pass that along and keep everybody informed. But I think that's a great approach. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Mark Wimoff asked if there's, can we have more than one wrestler entered at a weight class in a tournament? That's, that's a local decision. Uh, we actually leave that decision up to schools at this point, even at the varsity level. Um, you can enter more and those, and it depends on what class you're in those that are not the number one person are considered a JV participant. Most of the girls' competitions, if not all, are gonna be considered just like a JV competition. You could enter more than three if you wanted to, if the competition allows you to do that. What we do have to follow with the girls are the contest limitations that are the same as the boys, which is 10 tournament dates and eight duels. So most of them at this point are tournaments. So they would have 10 tournament dates to compete in, whether it's a boys tournament, a girls tournament, girls division, whatever that is. You look at the dates that they're competing and obviously the NFHS five match limit is, is the other limitation that we have. All right, I'll turn it back over to Julia. Thanks, Ron. Um, now we'll go over to Joan. She's gonna talk about the national overview Taylor's got our PowerPoint going up here. So Joan, take it away. Hi, I'm Joan Fulp. Uh, I always laugh, 42 years ago, I went to my first world championship. So it kind of gives you a time frame that I've been in wrestling. Two daughters that wrestle on the national uh, level, one still wrestling after, uh, this is her fourth quad. 
I work with Andrew Yamamoto. Uh, USA Wrestling is the organization that supports us, uh, sends us off to different uh, events uh, to promote girls wrestling. We've worked for about four and a half, almost five years now, creating data information, nationwide data, what's happening with the NFHS participation numbers, uh, what's happening with weight classes. Uh, we've been very fortunate to present two years in a row to the NFHS Executive Directors Conference, as well as uh, represent what's happening for states, what models are being used to get to that state championship, as well as, again, participation data and weight classes to the NFHS Wrestling Rules Committee. So uh, real quick here, participation data, we do use the NFHS data for this past season will not come out till the end of this month, end of August. So we also use and, and very strongly advocate for using uh, the NWCA weight hydration numbers. And you can take a look, I'm gonna start, you know, this is seven years of data, but if you look at 2017 with that over 14,000 girls wrestling across the nation, and then the jump to this year, where we use the weight hydration numbers, that's over under the note, we're at 20, over 28,000 girls. So we have really, in three years, doubled the numbers. The last two years, our percentages have been right at 30% growth, pretty much the fastest growing girls sport in the nation. Eight states still do not represent or report to the NFHS separate numbers. They are representing uh, those numbers are represented within the boys' numbers, but there are eight states, and this year that accounted for about 1,600 uh, girls wrestling. So growth is fantastic all across the nation. Next slide, we're going to take a look at what's happened in the last two years. We are now 28 states strong. Uh, we're waiting. We know we have another state that's in meetings this week. Uh, so hopefully by next week we'll hear some news. Uh, possibly have that 29th state, but it took 20 years to get the states that have that black asterisk in. There were only six. And then the spring of 2018, more states started joining in. And in two years, we are at 28 states. 22 states have said yes in some format of voting through their board, through their official uh, policies or process to hold a girls championship. Um, Nebraska, we've definitely included you guys because you are in emerging sports status. That's the same thing as Arizona went into uh, two years ago. And then this past year, they have just this spring said yes to an official championship uh, that'll be taken on uh, by the Arizona uh, AIA. And then Colorado did the same thing. Their state bylaws said we do a two-year pilot program. So they went into two-year pilot and then this coming year will also be their first year for uh, that fully encompassed uh, state championship run by their state scholastic organization. So, so 28 states strong. Uh, it, it's exciting. It's exciting to keep filling in that map. On the next slide, we're going to look at numbers and how they've increased once the state said yes to that championship. Uh, there's a lot of information here. Uh, I did three years of data and the increase over that two-year process, uh, and then the source of that data as well as the year the first championship. Take a look at Missouri as your neighboring state. 169 girls were wrestling. First year they said yes to that championship, it went to 910. And then this past year, over 1400, uh, over 1200 increase. And we don't know if we'll see another state with those numbers, uh, but that was super exciting. Kansas did a three year process. Kansas had 215, uh, 215 girls wrestling in that 17-18 uh, season went up to 376, and then this last year, they created that official state championship and went to 972. So, but they did have three years of running uh, a state girls championship run by a coach at a high school. Arizona, again, did an emerging sports status for two years, and you can take a look at their numbers while in emerging sports status from 286, two years down, 891, 605 increase. New Jersey, oh, New Jersey, only 124 girls increase that first year they held the championship 445 and you can see the numbers there so below 100 participants i like to look at this particular slide and we have nebraska right in there in bold print because you guys are moving forward and increasing your numbers without a doubt but iowa i was in the 90s you know uh for about two years and then their coaches and officials if you look in the purple their coaches and officials ran like uh, you guys did last year, that unofficial championship, unofficial, we don't like to use that term anymore, 
but it is an, uh, not fully under the umbrella of the Iowa State uh, Interscholastic Association. But their numbers, look at the increase in their numbers from 189 and this past year, those girls were like, this is it, this is happening, this is for us, 571. Oklahoma, the same thing. They run an exhibition this year, actually run by the Oklahoma State Association, 309, you know, from 87, their numbers jumped. The last two states, just take a look. Arkansas said yes to girls wrestling. They only had 44 girls. So every state is totally different in terms of the process they use to get to that state championship. But you can see their increase over that two years is uh, 121 girls. And South Dakota just said, just voted yes this year. They only had 39 girls that had uh, officially weight hydrated during that year. So I couldn't put a zero in the increase, but uh, because they, they're so close right there. And we know those numbers might not always be completely accurate. There could be, you know, give, give or take five or 10 girls in that uh, category. And the last slide I have uh, for you is what's happening uh, on the um, college opportunities. You know, right now, we're on such a dramatic increase in, in educational opportunities. And 85 colleges, it's growing. Uh, we usually have to ask every other week what the numbers are. Both divisions one, two, and three approved emerging sports status for girls uh, just this past spring. NAI had enough schools to run their first national championship in March of two, uh, 2019. This year, of course, COVID uh, put that uh, on the back burner. And just take a look. We know MMA and martial arts keep, continue to expand their visibility, whether it's TV or in your community or clubs, and girls are looking for their place in that combat sport world. And wrestling is there to offer that. And they do, girls desire and deserve to compete at a higher level. And please understand that if you have a young lady that's talented, maybe she's only been wrestling two years, there are colleges that want her. You know, the opportunities are there. They don't have to start competing in elementary or middle, high, uh, middle school before they have enough skill. Colleges are there and, and are just excited to have these young girls come in. So that opportunity to have that education and competing wrestling is available and, and it's just an awesome opportunity for all our young ladies. I get the, I get the awesome opportunity right now to introduce Jessica Medina. I've known Jessica since she was in high school. She's a California gal and that's where my daughters competed. Uh, Jessica went to the University of uh, the Cumberlands in Kentucky. She's a two-time world team member, six times on our US women's national team. That means top three in the nation. And Jessica then went and coached at Ferrum College. And now USA Wrestling has pulled her and is, she is our national women's development coach for USA Wrestling, working with all those youth. So Jessica, I'm excited you're with us tonight and take it away. Great, um, so thank you Joan for that introduction. Um, I do know a few of you on this call, so thank you for including me um, in this little piece of the process and it's just phenomenal to hear all that data and it, it gets me excited. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion in women's wrestling. Um, I just want to start off with a, a short um, just story of my experience. Um, I had graduated uh, from a high school in California in 2004. And when I had joined my wrestling team, I was a junior. That was my first year ever being exposed to the sport. And by the time I graduated my senior year, there was an opportunity for me to wrestle. And I think that point right there um, is the something that you don't normally see in a sport but within women's wrestling there was that opportunity for me although i was a beginner so um anyway moving on uh you know i think the first time i really understood the diversity of women's wrestling was when i left southern california and decided to go to school in southern kentucky and at first um you know i wasn't really sure what to expect because i had been on an all boys team um predominantly white males, a few minority, um, Hispanic and Asian, but really just that was my only experience with the wrestling team. So when I had gone to uh, University of the Cumberlands, I, um, you know, same thing, really unfamiliar with the culture in the region, but the women on the team were from all over the country. They were from different parts, um, you know, regionally, culturally, um, there were some women on the team who grew up on a farm and some people from the city and some people from the beach area, all these 
amazing different women. And it was, it was my community away from home and realizing that wow, the women's wrestling team is a signpost of um, what a melting pot is and a, a community of diverse women coming together in one sport. And so I, you know, looking back, I realized that was such a huge message to our, to the local community of, wow, this sport brought all these women together from all over the country. And on top of that, they, most people had never even heard of women's wrestling, let alone it being a collegiate sport. So, um, you know, I, I share this story with you because women's wrestling really has the power to shift the paradigms that maybe men's wrestling hasn't had, or maybe those old traditions um, that have existed for so long. And so, you know, the, the best part about wrestling is the barriers are so low that it's, it can be very welcoming for um, new athletes, people who want to try out the sport. And with women's wrestling, um, you know, I think that I've seen such a variety of physical abilities. It's not always the strongest, the fastest. It's, it's the girls who come in and sometimes bring that friend along and wanna be included and they feel welcomed there. And so you'll see big, small, short, tall, lean, compact, um, where sometimes I don't think you'll see that much of a, a diversity on a boys team it definitely exist. But I, you know, I think the stereotypical of what a wrestler looks like um, can be broken within women's wrestling. So you know, I think just keeping that in mind, like what, what your uh, um, preconception of what a, a wrestler is or what looks like with women's wrestling, I think the sport um, has really opened the dynamic to those people who maybe are not comfortable trying out for uh, the basketball team or the softball team or running, you know, and then they find their place in wrestling and this community. And so um, just including those women and giving them the opportunity, um, you know, whether it's on their male team, the goal is, is that female team, right? It's where they can connect with other girls on that team and really test themselves and feel like they can have a safe place to be themselves, to be um, a female wrestler, to be feminine, to be there, you know, to challenge themselves and be okay to fail in front of their peers, especially their female peers. Um, you know, I think that's where that safe place allows those numbers to grow. And most of the time, it, you guys can probably attest to this, it's literally, you know, a girl who's interested and ha ask her friend to come with her and, you know, try out with her. And so again, um, just, taking, just taking a step back and looking at women's wrestling, I think that um, there's so much growth in the diversity within just women's wrestling and, and, and wrestling as a whole. So I really think that women can set the bar um, with what that looks like in the future. And, you know, wrestling is wrestling. Um, you know, I love that part about it and, and an athlete's an athlete, but I think women's wrestling has um, kind of paved the way for, you know, a new path of what a wrestler looks like. And again, those college opportunities um, allow for women who maybe never have wrestled in their life and decided that they wanted to join the sport. And now there's an opportunity for them to go to college when maybe leaving the state wasn't an option or even thinking about college. So um, just keep in mind as you guys recruit those girls, don't count anyone out. Ask, give them the opportunity, include them. You never know who's going to make a great wrestler um, and who's going to contribute to the team. They just need that platform, that opportunity, and sometimes someone just to ask. So there you go. And I don't know if Ray had anything else he wanted to include on that. No, I, I'm same same boat as you. Um, diversity in body size and and ethnicity is is something that this sport brings for everybody. And again, like you said, uh, you'll have girls that you would not expect, and all of a sudden they just blossom and they find their way in, in the sport. So. Um, Never count anyone out. Ask everybody. And I think Les is up next to give a coach perspective. I'm going to come from the coach's perspective. Most of you on here know who I am, yep. I guess. Uh, my name's Les Painter. Uh, I'm uh, lucky enough to have six daughters of my own. Um, I coached in uh, Cambridge, Nebraska. I was the head coach there for 10 years. 
Um, I've had the privilege of uh, being an assistant coach under Tyler Legate at uh, Pierce, Nebraska. Um, right now, my coach's perspective is probably a lot like some of yours. Um, when I first um, had a young lady come with me, I, I wasn't excited about it. I, wasn't, I did not want a young lady on my team. I really felt like uh, she was going to take away from what I was really trying to do and accomplish. And, uh, and I, was, I was completely wrong. The little gal that joined me, her name was Kaylee Max Tomlin. And uh, this little gal completely changed my heart and changed my mind. When she started in my club as a first grader, um, I just figured like most of us coaches, you know what, she's a little first grader. She's going to quit wrestling by the time she gets up there. This little girl didn't quit wrestling. I loved her passion. I love what she brought every year to us. You know, I remember telling her, you know, you can choose wrestling. You can choose basketball. She was a heck of a basketball, going to be the best basketball player on their team. And I remember our boys wrapping their arms around her and, and, and just enjoy, I mean, she would, in junior high, again, she was probably more developed than, than most of our boys. So she won most of her things. And, uh, and so I caught myself cheering harder for her than I cheered for even some of my boys sometimes. I'll never forget in the spring when she came to me and she said, Coach Painter, uh, I'm going to wrestle this year. So I was like, okay, we got camps to go to. Let's get her done. She went wrestled 126 pounds. And literally that, that year probably broke my heart watching. She won two matches that whole year. But she never gave up. She never quit trying. It was really hard on me because I wasn't used to having somebody cry after every single match. But you know what? It was okay. It was okay. I, I and now have had enough daughters. Crying's just part of it. I've, I've come to realize, you know. After that season, we sat down with her mom and dad, and I just said, she's going to weigh 140 pounds next year. Nothing against it, but it's going to be tough. I said, you guys make the decision, though. But I said, if it was me, I would wrestle. I would go to girls only events. And from that time forward, from her sophomore to her senior year, I watched a girl that had zero confidence coming out of her first year till she lost one match over those next three years. She was our Disney duels MVP. She was, a, you know, she won multiple AAU and USA events. She did go to college, decided that was not for her to wrestle there. She loved it. But next year, Ray Maxwell stole her from me, I've decided. But she's going to get to coach with Ray Maxwell at West Point. And, and what an opportunity for this young lady, because if not, she wouldn't have these opportunities. But she really changed my why. And she's the reason my oldest daughter, much to people's probably dismay and pierce, is probably going to be a wrestler. But at least she has the choice now, because I probably wouldn't have let her. Again, I have a little 140-pound girl who physically couldn't have competed. But now with you guys and our help, she's going to have the ability to be a, a, a girls-only wrestler, which she will have a lot of success if, if she chooses. So that's my why. And I would tell a lot of you, just like me, you know what, give it an opportunity. Give them a chance because that's all they need. As you can see by the picture, those two right there are family to me. And that's what, that's what wrestling does to us. So I want you – no different than boys and girls – they just want to be included. And thank you for your time. But Kim, we'll give the parents perspective. All right, I'm Kim Harrell and I have a daughter who wrestles. Um, she has been wrestling for eight years now. Uh, she started when she was four. When she started, um, she, we lived in Plainview, so small town, Nebraska, or Creighton, excuse me. Um, but small town, anyway, there was no opportunities for girls outside of um, the school. So she asked when she was four if she could wrestle because her brother wrestled. She wanted to go to practice. She wanted something to do. She, she was um, an active kid who wanted to just find a place, I guess. So we gave her the opportunity to go. Just like Les said, our attitude was, ah, oh, you're gonna go once, you're gonna quit, you're gonna hate it, fine, go. We're never going to have to worry about this again. Um, she changed our mind. <laughs> She's still wrestling. Um, for the first oh, four or five years of her wrestling, she didn't have girls to wrestle with. Um, we can see the struggle that she had with that, uh, just the confidence level, um, just 
the ability to feel like she fit in. And as um, girls wrestling has grown at the club level, that's where she's at right now, um, more girls are getting involved. And as more girls have been getting involved, um, I, we've seen her confidence level grow tremendously. Um, she feels like a leader now. Um, you know, she knows that uh, she's got other girls that she can look to that are the same like her. They, they wanna wrestle, they, they're a family. Um, for those of you who have seen the boys side of wrestling and the family feel that you get with the boys uh, together, the girls, the feel of a family um, with the girls is probably tenfold once you get a group of them in there. So just that opportunity alone to have a group to, that my daughter can go to um, for support, uh, to feel like she's a part of a group, leadership opportunities. Um, a big one for me as a parent is I know that she has self-defense behind her now. She's got those skills that when she goes to college, hopefully she'll wrestle in college, that's one of her big goals. Um, that she can go on a campus and I don't really have to worry about something happening to her so much, maybe as a person who uh, doesn't have that wrestling background. So that's huge for me as a parent and um, the opportunity to have her be able to go to college, hopefully on a scholarship with those opportunities growing like they are, would be awesome. So that's kind of my parent perspective. And I will let uh, Katie tell her athlete perspective. So I started wrestling when I transferred to West Point my sophomore year. Um, I enjoyed it a lot because before I started wrestling, I was always really shy and closed. And I just, I was just not the type to, you know, go all out or any of that. And then um, I came to West Point and I became really close to the girls and they, um, the wrestlers that Coach Maxwell had, like they inspired me to wrestle, so I went out for it. And then um, I just started, you know, opening up more. And we became like our team, my team and I are like a family. We always cheer each other on. And uh, I never had that in any other sport. I never had a close bond like I do when I wrestle. It's opened up a lot of opportunities. It's taught me so many lessons. Um, it's helped me keep in shape. and. I have a really close bond with my coach over here, Maxwell, and I never had that in any other sport. So now I'm, I decided to wrestle for York College, and I know I'm not going to regret it. So I will now let Coach Maxwell talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, basically starting a program and talking to your administration. Um, number one, you want to get their blessing. Um, make sure it's okay with the, uh, the administration to go. And if you can pursue that even farther, uh, get their backing. Uh, talk to them a little bit about Title IX, how that's met. Um, there's only, for the most schools in Nebraska, there's only one other winter sport, and that's uh, girls basketball. And there are quite a few girls who really don't really be interested in that sport, so it gives them another option. Um, and then ask what's allowed for recruiting. Um, at one time, I had a principal tell me that I could have uh, the all a student body from freshmen through seniors, and then um, that was squelched down as they had an admin meeting and said that I had to put flyers around school and and just people come to a room and have a meeting afterwards. But um, you may have an admin that says you get to speak to the entire female body of the school. If you have that backing, fantastic, because uh, you'll have a lot of show some great interest. Um, also make sure you let them know about all the benefits. Um, Katie touched on a few of them. I think Les touched on a few and so did Kim. Um, girls are gonna be actively involved in the school. It'll raise the school spirit. Um, and there's enough data out there to show the girls that are involved um, we'll have higher grades and uh, also start to doing other activities. So um, that increases it and increases their confidence. Um, we live in a society that tends to beat women down and uh, this sport gives them an option to, uh, to boost their confidence and to stand up for themselves and uh, allows them to 
uh, pursue some, some things that they never would have done. One of those things is post-secondary. Uh, just as Katie said, she's going on to York College to wrestle. So she's getting a scholarship to, to help pay for that education. Uh, possibly that may not have been in the, in the cards for her if she had not uh, wrestled. So there's just some things you need to talk to your admin about, get their blessing. If, if you do it and, and get their backing, it's even better. Um, but you need to, to, to start at the ground floor and talk to them and uh, start at the top, get their, mm -hmm. their uh, blessings to say, go ahead and pursue it. And then you're not gonna have any conflict. Um, I think I'll turn it back over to Kim and she'll talk about the idea of being a female coach. All right, Taylor, do you wanna, are you running the slides right now or is Joan? Taylor is. Yes. Do you wanna start that video? Sorry for the technical difficulty. I am working on it. That's okay. Okay, we're working on it. I'm finding the right one. It's here. Thought I had it queued up. Okay. My name is Kim Harrell, and today I'd like to share my story of how I wrestle with advocating for females in the sport of wrestling. My wrestling journey began eight years ago when my four-year-old daughter asked if she could wrestle. At the time, she was the only female in a room full of boys. This continued for several years. Over the eight years that my daughter has been on her wrestling journey, I've learned the importance of having a female that can serve as a role model and an advocate for the young women in the sport of wrestling. Females need someone that they can look up to. They need a role model. They need leaders who they can aspire to be like. They need someone who can be a voice for them when they're concerned about speaking. They need someone who will welcome them into a room full of boys with open arms. Over the summer, I was approached by the high school wrestling coach in our community about being a part of the girls wrestling coaching staff at our high school. I eagerly embrace that opportunity because I know I can be a leader for the young females entering our wrestling community. I know that I am a role model for those girls to look up to, someone they can aspire to be like. I will be their voice when they are in need. I will be those open arms that they are wanting when they're entering a new and unknown sport to them. I'm excited for this journey and I cannot wait to see other females getting involved in the coaching roles so females have someone that they can look up to. My name is Kim Harrell, and this is how I wrestle with coaching female wrestlers. All right, so that's a little bit of my story, I guess, of how I am involved, I guess, now on the coaching side of uh, wrestling. Um, one thing that we've talked about through our committee is the importance of having a female just as a um, someone that young women can look up to um, as leaders and seeing people in an, a leadership role is really important to them. So um, I don't have a wrestling background per se in the um, actual participation side of it. However, I have um, 
I've had some really amazing mentors to follow and learn from through our club, um, through the high school in town. I've done my own education on it. I guess I went on and I've gotten my um, bronze level coaching card for USA Wrestling. Um, as I guess as a new person in the coaching side of it, of wrestling, I'm, I'm a student of the sport, just like our athletes are. I'm learning from the male coaches who are in the room. Um, but that's okay because those females that are coming into our rooms, our wrestling rooms, they need to have a female to look to um, and, and um, know that they have someone that they can go to and someone that's advocating for them. So um, I guess when you're thinking about maybe adding a female coach to your staff, think outside the box. It doesn't have to be someone who has wrestling background. Um, we know in the state of Nebraska, there's not very many women who have come from an actual participation background in wrestling. But um, we have, you have coaches in your schools that are, they know the coaching side of it already. They can learn the sport, but they know how to coach. So look for your, your track coaches, your softball coaches who are out of season. Um, and those people can be developed into wrestling coaches at, um, for the females as well. So um, I guess Coach Wilcox is on here. If you want to say anything about how our little journey started, I guess you're welcome to if you'd like to. Yeah, of course. Uh, hopefully you guys can all hear me. Um, first of all, I could thank everybody for advocating girls wrestling. Um, you know, it's long overdue that girls wrestling becomes sanctioned. Um, but going back to my... My experience with Kim, it all started, uh, I think, last summer. She brought her kids to uh, a wrestling camp, and I could tell right then she had a passion for the sport. Um, you know, she, admit, she admitted herself she doesn't have a lot of experience um, in the wrestling realm necessarily, but she's been involved in the sport for eight years. Um, she's been a head coach in other sports, so she knows the coaching aspect of it. And, you know, she's a part of the task force, the Nebraska task force to promote women's wrestling. So I'd be stupid not to have her on my staff. Um, she's done a great job up to this point, And I know she'll continue to do a great job advocating the sport. Um, she's helped with social media stuff as well. And, you know, I'm excited to have her on our staff. And I do think it's important for young ladies on the sport of wrestling to also have a female perspective. Um, and not just a male perspective, but a female perspective as well. So... You know, three other coaches, um, you know, if you're interested in, in hiring a female coach who doesn't have a lot of experience, that, that's okay. I mean, like I said, Kim has a lot of passion, and uh, that perspective, female perspective is uh, very important to me and my staff. So, if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks, Coach. You bet. I'm just going to hit off a little bit of how um, we we recruited here um, a little bit in uh, Pierce. And again, what Ray said is so important. Make sure you talk to your administration. Don't get yourself in trouble before you start. But one of the important things for us is uh, making sure these we put ourselves out there and we, we make sure every girl knows we want them on our wrestling team. We want them. We are going to advocate for them. They're going to know that uh, Coach Legate, Coach Painter, Coach Frydenberg, all of us want these girls out there. And one way we can do it is at the beginning of the year, we go and talk to our volleyball coach, our softball coach, you know, our golf coach, our cross country coach, or some of you soccer. And we go visit with these girls at the very beginning of the year because we know their sport could possibly go into when we start wrestling. And so we, we go in there and we talk to them and say, hey, this is a possibility for you. If you're not out for basketball, again, we're not trying to steal anybody's Anything, we, we just want every girl to be involved, involved in some way, shape, or form. We all know that the more kids we get involved in our school, the less problems we have. And then um, something we try to do is the girls that aren't out, um, we, get, we get to find them at the cafeteria. We go in the hallway. We find the girls that aren't doing anything in the fall, and we say, hey, we'd love to have you. Well, we don't, we've never done sports. We do speech. Oh, you wouldn't believe this, but we do a lot of talking and wrestling, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it is, but we let them know. And first of all, you know, we make sure they know we care about them. Um, you have to do that. Uh, and then when it gets closer to the season, 
Um, we'll, we'll have it on the announcements. We'll put it in the school paper. Hey, uh, we're having a, a, an all girls meeting on this day and this time, you know, if you're interested and you can't make it to the meeting, make sure you please come talk to us. Just different little things like that and putting posters out like uh, Coach Maxwell um, um, said. And I always try to have some girl that maybe is wrestling for us. She goes and makes the posters. And then I try to encourage each one of my girls. So this year I know for sure we started with nine last year and, and we ended with five. And I always tell people wrestling is like our state motto. It, yes, it's not for everybody. But at the same point, we had nine girls start and try. So um, we we're going to ask in those five girls to try to bring five more girls with them. You know, and if every year we get that, guess what? Next year, if we get 10 this year, we're going to try like heck to get 20 the year after that. And, and, and that's one of the ways we help build our program also. So just some little things we do on our recruiting end. Again, you guys are all smart. You've had to recruit boys too. We, we know it. But at the same point, the biggest thing I can tell you is girls um, can see right through you. They know whether you care. If you want them there, you don't. So make sure when you're selling this, you sell it with that same passion that you would sell it to your boys with. So I'm going to move this on. I think Ray is next with uh, talking to parents. i uh, talking about the posters and stuff. Oh. There's just some sample posters that we have around. Um, I just put up a poster. Um, we have uh, bulletin boards throughout the school, and I put these up, put them in the girls' locker room, um, saying that we're going to have a, a girls' meeting, much like Les just talked about. Um, and then there's a rustle like a girl. You're welcome to take any of these ideas and incorporate them into posters you can put around your school. Um, put them in the cafeteria and areas where people, uh, you know, congregate and really try to get that information out there and talk it up. Um, make sure they have a contact number. Maybe put your email on there or wherever your school allows for a communication between your athletes and you. Um, but try to get as much information out there as you can. This is a more thorough one that I put up around school just to kind of educate people. I updated it to the present criteria and pre present information we have. Um, and this just gives a whole lot more um, ideas uh, that talks about specifics like the, the self-defense and physical conditioning, not, over, not only the, the physical aspect, but also the mental aspect of, of wrestling. Um, talks about getting into the ground level. You want to be a record setter and, and hold records in some program, this is your option. You can get in on the ground floor and get started. Um, be part of a winning tradition. Um, people, by and large, want to be winners. And uh, wrestling offers that. It, uh, you get out of it what you put into this sport. So uh, they need to know that they're going to be working hard. Um, Self-defense, I know Kim talked about that. Uh, they're walking across the college campus and someone with uh, some low morals jumps from behind. They know how to reverse at least incapacitate them long enough where they can get away. Um, so it's a great uh, self-defense um, teaching. The, like Katie said, um, scholarships, colleges, you, you get an offer for uh, scholarships, especially now. There are so many colleges that are being added right now. Um, you can have girls that wrestle one year, two years, um, be offered scholarships. Um, they're trying to fill rosters, so it's it's a, a great avenue for these girls to to go on to the second level if that's what they want to do. Um, I usually put out that our practice is usually done by five thirty, six o'clock, so kind of have some time frame. Some negatives. Um, some of them don't think that way, which which I'm glad, but it's going to be very hard. It's going to be harder than any other sport that they're in. Um, so. Again, it's total mind and body conditioning. And some negatives to some people, the tournaments are all day long. I want them to know pros and cons up front before they make their decision. Um, but uh, a lot of that family is uh, generated on those all day tournaments. Um, my parents have, uh, my dad has passed on, but my mom still talks about those all day gym times with other people. And she is still uh, very close to those people uh, and I've been out of wrestling, I've been out of high school 43 years now. So um, that's a long time to, to stay together and, and to, to have the benefits of this sport. And so I try to present that to those people um, through these posters around school. And that's for everybody to read. And again, high traffic areas. This one probably more than others, just because 
uh, there's a lot more information for them. They can stand around and do some reading. So um, I'll turn it over to Kim and she can give us another perspective. All right. So just, just, uh, in talking about how to sell wrestling to girls, um, one thing I, I taught elementary school and I, uh, in class, even the younger kids, just being really enthusiastic with them and talking to girls and just letting them know um, that this is something, wow, you look like you'd be a really great wrestler. Um, you're strong. That might be a great sport for you to go into. A lot of times girls, they don't even know that wrestling exists. So um, just being really enthusiastic about it and letting them know what a great sport it is and all the benefits of it and how you can see them being leaders um, and role models and that they'll have an opportunity, like the other two have said, um, to compete for awards and records and um, get them involved in the recruiting process. So have them, you know, if you find that one is really interested in it, have them bring a friend, let the friend come try it out for a day or two. Um, and, and it'll grow. So the, the more the merrier for girls, you know, they bring a friend, they're gonna bring a friend and, and, and the process will continue. So uh, just like Ray said, you need to be informative about it. Let them know what they're gonna be getting into so that it's not a surprise to them. And then um, just really creating that family feel and that bond um, of a group of girls working towards the same goal and that you care about them is, is a, just super important and girls buy into that kind of stuff so um, yeah just some easy ways to start it out and I'll go ahead um, I never did really introduce myself I'm the coach for West Point Beamer uh, public school uh, we started wrestling we talked uh, we went to a meeting that Ron um, chaired uh, down in Lincoln and he kind of introduced the ideas of girls wrestling we came back um, I got the blessings from the admin, and we started with six girls. Uh, the next year we had 12, then we had 22, and we had 22 again this year. Um, and the, the first ever uh, NSWCA state championship, we were fortunate enough to win this year. Um, so it, it's uh, been a, an adventure for me, and it's been an adventure for uh, learning some different things about coaching girls and things like that. Um, how to sell to the parents. Uh, number one, not only do girls see right through you, but parents see right through you. You have to legitimately show them that you care about their daughter. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have three daughters of my own, and um, we don't always see eye to eye, but I guarantee you there comes uh, some protection. I'm there, and I'm looking out for their best interest, and you need to let them know about that. Answer all their questions, even if try to encourage them to ask questions because some of them may think they're dumb questions or whatever. Usually when they ask one, the one sitting next to them has the same question. They're just not old enough to ask. And then bring about what you have as a parent. Um, many of us coaches are parents and uh, let them know some concerns you have. Um, I know with my, my girls, uh, my, my own physical girls, um, I wanted them to make sure they enjoyed the sport, um, that it was for them, that they were open to talk to me at any time, that uh, I was always approachable, that there was no stupid questions, there was no, um, no barrier between us as far as conversation goes. Um, that was something that I, I experienced as a parent, so I try to teach that to my wrestlers as well. Uh, discuss your role as the coach. Um, and let them know that there are communication avenues. If you feel comfortable sharing your cell phone with them, then do that. If not, there's emails. Um, they can go through the administration in school. Um, but talk to them about the communication because you have to maintain communication with the parents. Um, you, have, you have one of the most valuable things God has ever given to these, these people and they're in your hands. So um, make sure they understand that you understand that that you're willing to do anything and everything to, to make that young girl uh, better. Um, so uh, let them also know about the lessons. And I talked a little bit about this before, um, self-defense, the confidence that they gain, a work ethic. Um, wrestling is not for the lazy, I'll guarantee you. You have to work. And uh, it creates a family. It's kind of like uh, 
our troops when, when they go to the front line. They, they fight together, they bleed together. Um, they become such a tight knit group that uh, it never ever ends. And that's the same way that um, wrestling does. So let them know about that, that they are accepted. They may not be in the most popular clique in the school, they're gonna be accepted in wrestling. They're part of it. Uh, they're part of the family. They've gone through the, the struggles everybody else has and it creates a great family. And then financially, parents are invested in that. Let them know about the post-graduation opportunities uh, that uh, they can have scholarships. I got a picture here on this slide of Katie. She uh, won a scholarship this year that uh, we had in my dad's name that uh, we started. And um, my dad and mom wanted it to be given to the girls wrestlers since we had a girls program. And uh, she was a, the winner of it this year. And then she also got scholarship to wrestle at your college. So um, there's financial benefits as well as educational to continue on. So that is something that uh, we need to make sure the parents know. Um, I think we go on to the next slide. I talk about gear. Um, some of the things we need to really understand. Uh, let's, wait here. Here. Go ahead. And let's wait for gear and kind of an overview of coaching girls first. Okay. Um, hi, so um, my name is Andrea Yamamoto, and as Joan Fulp earlier um, described, uh, she and I have been working together on girls um, high school wrestling for the last couple of years. Um, I wrestled for my high school back in the mid 80s, and then I had the opportunity to uh, compete against girls for the very first time uh, through Team USA. Uh, and then since moving back to my home state of Washington, I've had a lot of wonderful opportunities to be um, a volunteer coach of uh, both boys and girls. So um, I'm just going to kind of do kind of a, a maybe a broad overview on, on coaching girls. Um, we could do a whole series of webinars full of information and ideas on how to help you be uh, have confidence and feel successful in coaching girls. But I, I think we have to start at the very beginning, which is uh, girls want to do all sports and they especially want to do wrestling. Um, we want to do combat sports. And the opportunity to do a combat sport uh, in high school is, um, is you're, you're just gonna draw a lot of girls into your wrestling program that as coaches have said, may not be choosing other sports and, and they, they haven't found a sport that speaks to them. Um, and so we know that our sport attracts those kids, boys and girls. And so, you know, opening your wrestling room and recruiting girls, they're, they're gonna come right in. Um, for coaches, you know, we, we have coaches on this spectrum uh, right now. Uh, we have the coach that is 100% recruiting like crazy, wants 30 girls to turn out. And then we have a group in the middle. It's like, okay, you know, I'm going to put some flyers up and I'm going to see what happens. And then we have coaches that have a lot of apprehension. And um, what I want all coaches to know, but particularly those that feel apprehensive, is this. You all know how to teach wrestling skills. You all know how to mentor kids through the highs, through the lows, with their confidence, with self-doubt, learning to love competition. You know how to mentor kids through those experiences. And you all know how to build relationships with kids so you can figure out what makes them tick, right? The kid that needs to crack jokes before their wrestling match or the kid that needs to be alone, we know the kids that are very serious and driven and have very championship goals in our, in our practice environment, and we know which ones are, they want to be a part of the team. They may not have those championship goals, and so we know how to have them in our program, too. Um, and we all, you guys all know how to motivate athletes. Yeah. So those skills that you have acquired through coaching, those don't change no matter who's in front of you, whether it's a boy or a girl. So um, I really want to encourage you to, to have self-belief in your, your teaching of skills, mentoring kids, and motivating kids. That doesn't matter, you know, uh, whether it's a, a female wrestler who's a beginner or it's a varsity athlete, those things uh, remain the same. Um, as some of the other coaches have talked about, they talked about energy. Um, 
let's say you recruit and you get five girls or you get 10 or whatever the case may be. Um, I'm going to echo what they said, which is um, showing them that you're happy that they're there every day. And if you're excited for them to learn, that's what they need. Right. And all your app, all of your wrestlers need that. But as you bring those girls in, do, do the best you can to have some face to face interaction with them. You know, some, some of your programs are really large. They're small. Have, you know, just that quick face to face interaction. How's your day going? Hey, it looks like you're getting that skill. Little things to help them know that you're excited about them being there. You're going to get a lot of beginners. Okay. But you know how to coach beginners. We typically don't grab a beginner first day, throw them in a headlock and say, okay, let's go. Right. So that's going to be the same with a lot of your girl beginners too. Um, you uh, are going to use all of your teaching modalities. So when I come into a wrestling for the first time and whether I'm coaching boys or girls, um, I, I, I use verbal to start. So I, I don't do hands on yet. Um, they don't, the kids don't know me. A lot of them are new to wrestling. They're not, you, uh, some kids are going to come in. They're not used to a sport that has hands-on teaching. That's something that they actually have to learn. And as you grow more confident in teaching skills on girls, so you get more confident in teaching skills, they get used to a sport that has hands-on learning. About halfway through the season, you know, you're, you're, everyone is going to start getting more comfortable. But you can use all your teaching modalities. I do a lot of verbal. I'll grab another adult coach and show technique on, on coach. I'll grab two kids that are more experienced and I'll have them teach skills. And like I said, as the girls learn, this is a hand, this is a hands-on learning environment and you get more used to teaching skills hands-on with girls about midway through this season, you're, you know, you're really, any little hurdles that you, you know, thought might be there start to disappear. Um, and then use, you, there's online resources for kind of learning some details about coaching girls. There's plenty of information out there, but you should definitely reach out to other coaches in your school that are coaching girls sports and just find out, you know, little things that you can pick up about specifically coaching girls, whether that's motivating them or as Les said, the tears, you know, um, great thing about girls is they'll let you know when they're not happy about something. And those tears are often your greatest coaching moments, right? Because that's when you're really coaching the person, not the performer. You're coaching the person. Those tears might be, I'm afraid, oh, I'm so embarrassed, whatever. That's your, that's your great coaching moment. And I think coaching girls uh, really en enhances your coaching ability. I think you'll find that as you coach girls, you, you learn so much from coaching them that you're like, oh, I can transfer these things, you know, to all of my kids. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I just think that it's one day at a time, just like for all the girls coming in, you, they can't do a single leg perfectly on day one. And you can't be the perfect girls coach on day one, right? You do your best, you communicate with them, get feedback, right? And it's back to the drawing board every day. Every practice, everyone gets like a do-over. Um, I'm really excited about Nebraska's opportunities to expand, um, uh, you know, the, these teams for girls. And I'm really excited for you all to fall in love with uh, coaching girls wrestling. And, I, and we're going to have Les talk about his experiences and his strategies that he uses for some of those hands-on situations and how he approaches uh, things when girls uh, come into the room. Guys, I'm going to keep this short. The first thing I, and the most important thing I can tell you that I've learned even probably more from my daughters than even coaching wrestling here is my tone of voice. I am so enthusiastic. When I get in the wrestling room, I am 100% all in all the time. And my tone really can set or break our whole thing for our girls. So really watch your tone when you're with your girls. And the biggest thing I can tell you um, like I said, I not only have six daughters that those other two you saw in that picture, they're, they're, they're mine now. Be yourself. Be you. Uh, because that's what they want. Don't, don't, act, don't act like you're in junior high around these kids because if you're nervous around them, then they're a nervous wreck. You know, don't be uncomfortable. You know, I tell my girls all the time, I'm not going to treat you like you're in junior high because you're not. Okay, you're high school girls. We're going to get through this. But, again, I'm not going to insult any of you guys' intelligence. You're all great coaches, and I know that because I've been around most of you. So 
thank you for the opportunity for me to be able to speak to you guys too. And I don't know who's next. Hey, we'll just do a quick run through. I know we're going a little bit long, so we're just basically going to go. One thing you may overlook is number one gear, get wrestling shoes. Um, we really need to make sure they, they have that. Most uh, stores have them only in boys' sizes, so they're going to have to find out exactly what to do and get that. Make sure they're properly covered for a contact sport. Um, you can visualize what all goes on, um, but material is going to get twisted and turned and make sure that they are covered. It's, you don't want a, an episode um, and a girl be embarrassed. Uh, you don't want the referees to feel in a competition. Uh, you don't want the fans to feel uncomfortable. Make sure they, they are uh, properly covered. Um, singlet versus two-piece. I always thought singlet was the way to go. I, I like a wo woman's cut singlet. And I usually put a compression shirt underneath just for, uh, for comfort for the fans and parents and, and some girls. Um, so I usually do that. And I thought maybe the two-piece would be the answer. Um, but some girls have come up to me and said that they don't like the two-piece because the shirt will ride up in their midsection and they tend to be a little bit heavier or something like that. I never thought about those things. So um, have those things in mind. And when they practice, compression shorts underneath their, their, their practice shorts, um, just so it covers so there's no embarrassment to take care of. And uh, med kit, it's going to be a little bit different than a guy's med kit. Um, just make sure you're prepared for everything that goes along with, with coaching women. Um, I think we'll turn it back over to Tila, and she can go ahead and finish out today. So really quickly. Um, yes, yeah, go for yeah. it. Yes, yeah, so we just have some resources on here. Uh, of course, the Sanction Nebraska website, which you can also get to from the Wrestling A Girl website, and then go to the drop-down menu where you'll find the Sanction Nebraska tab. The Wrestling A Girl website itself, uh, Lucha Fit, which is from Catherine Shy, who is Joan Fulp's daughter, multiple-time national team member. She posts a lot of great articles on there. Um, everything from being a female coach dealing with imposter syndrome to how to pack for a tournament to just general nutrition tips. So a really great website with a lot of really good resources, blog articles, that kind of a thing. And then on the USA Wrestling website, there are some high school state sanctioning resources. And then you'll see Misco Sports down there at the bottom. Also, if you have any questions, you can reach out to anyone over on that right side of the page, uh, Ray Maxwell, who just spoke, Les Painter, and Ryan Stussy. And then of course, Ron Higdon over at the NSAA is the Nebraska women's wrestling expert, and then myself and Taylor as well from the wrestling a girl side of things. My email is Julia at wrestlelikeagirl.org. I'll put that in the chat as well. And then Taylor, I believe your email is just Taylor at wrestlinggirl.org. Is that right? Yeah. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to anyone listed here or Taylor or myself. If you have any questions about state sanctioning Nebraska, the national landscape of wrestling, um, the collegiate landscape of wrestling, whatever it may be. Uh, we're here for you guys and, and just to serve as resources for any questions that you have. So feel free to reach out at any point. Also, um, this will be, this slide will be linked from Wrestle Like a Girl's website, Sanction Nebraska. Um, maybe we'll email it out, but there's links on all of these for, to different articles search, such as One Courageous Girl has a lot of information um, expanding upon what we talked about today. And um, just reach out to your, reach out to your team, your network in Nebraska. You guys are a really fantastic group. So, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Taylor and Julia, but on your resource page, you have like sample letters that they can send to parents and sample letters they can send to their administration uh, with all, it's very well spoken and they can just add, add their name to it or, or change it a little bit, but it gives you a, a guide uh, of what to start with. Correct. Yes. Yep. And then this, this uh, meeting itself, along with the other webinars that we have, will be, uh, is being recorded, and we'll put it on our website under the wrestling tab. There's a girls wrestling tab on our wrestling page. So uh, the Wrestle Like a Girl um, website will also be linked there as well. So we're going to try to keep all of our information easily accessible so that you can get to it fairly quickly. Excellent. Is there any questions that anybody has? You could type them in the box or just unmute yourself and ask away.
Oh, I think that's it, guys. Yes, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, what, yeah, what a wonderful state you guys are. Thanks for staying long. Um, you guys uh, have such a resource there with each other. Thanks to Wrestle Like a Girl for hosting these and, and giving us all the information and resources. Really, really appreciate it. They've done a tremendous job. And tomorrow, um, same time, we're going to have a similar webinar for, for parents and athletes. So send your parents and athletes. If there's um, girls that are curious about wrestling but not quite sure about it, it'll be a great place to get for some more information. And um, hope to see your guys' team tomorrow. One I think well. One question did come in from Kara. So there is a question on the board. Oh, thank you. Ron, I think that's probably you. Um, that, that's what I was talking about with uh, co-ops at this point with the emerging sport. Uh, the question was, can LPS wants to know if they can form area teams? Because we are not a sanctioned sport yet, the, the answer to that is no. They can't form a team with schools partnering together um, unless they want the boys team to be co-opt as well. And LPS is class A and Class A doesn't co-op, so the answer to that would be no. Some smaller schools that are Class D schools, and they add a couple of schools to their, uh, if they wanted to co-op with a couple other schools and it didn't change their classification, you'd have to get that approval from both school boards and send it to the NSA for approval. Okay. Okay. Great job, guys. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, Rebecca.